I always say I never know how to start these things, but then we kind of go right into it. So we're just going to start it how we normally do, where I pretend to be confused, but I'm not that confused. So enough rambling. Not an accident podcast. Adam Brammer, MI40, fitness extraordinaire, my personal trainer. Exactly. My personal trainer. I'm excited to have you on here for so many reasons, man. You know, looking at your bio as far as, you know, the timing you've had with athletes or the time spent with, you know, some of these fitness athletes and then training you've done yourself. And it's just truly amazing. So thanks for being here, man. Thank you, man. It's a, it's an honor and it's a privilege. And like, it's so, it's so good to be able to like, you've been in my world over at the gym for a while. So it's good to kind of like be you and on your side of things in the business world. Just so interesting to me. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And we've had some great conversations during our sessions about, you know, just a variety of different things and kind of self-improvement, you know, throughout and and helping each other. So I'm excited to have you and I'm excited for you to share your experience with our with our uh, audience rather. So let's start from the beginning. How did your fitness journey start? So I was like a normal kid, just like every other kid in the 90s. I want to say I was collecting comic books. In the basement, there were some some weights and some 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 storage, and I was rooting around through the other boxes in the storage, and I found a box of bodybuilding magazines. At that point, all the the comics and all the Legos and everything else got pushed to the side. And I was like, I want to look like you this. were that young. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I didn't know anything, but I was like, well, we got some weights down here. And pretty soon, I started to copy the routines, and um, you know, life. You're a child, right? So I didn't really have the ability to like lock in on something for a long time, but that's kind of the spark, spark of the passion. Started getting more into weights really seriously about 17, was reading some really good stuff about some really high level coaches, what they were doing. And I was like, oh, I can copy this. I understand this. It, I had already been, you know, the internet was in its, um, in its infancy. There was no social media like now, which is, was probably really good for me. I just was reading everything that I could. And I I kind of at that age knew I was in high school. I was like, I think I want to be a coach. I think like I'm so passionate. I want to learn more. It's kind of in my nature that I'm a bit of a bookworm. I like to read. I like to learn. I like to understand things. And at that point, and still now, the body is the most interesting thing for me to try to understand. So I kind of went the non-traditional route. I went to school, but I dropped out because I, I realized like academics is for people that want to work in college sports, right? But I wanted to work with Oh, athletes. So I got out of there because I realized that the coaches that I was following, they weren't doing anything with their degrees. It wasn't anything that they were learning during their education. I think education is so important, but it doesn't necessarily give you a direct pipeline to what I was trying to do. So I hooked up at that point. I'd been doing a little bit of training, working with some guys. I got linked up with a boxing team when I was in my early 20s, and I spent about 10 years with a, with a boxing team doing their strength and conditioning, but also boxing. That was kind of intense. Okay. And that was really, really important. Not for the experience of training the fighters, but it was an experience of being around professional prize fighters and, and understanding their work ethic and their their attitude towards like what it takes for them to be able to, well, that's their living, right? So like you just don't get paid if you if you lose a fight. So everything in your day, it's like every decision is, is like, this will make or break me. I really was... So kind of like blown away by their, by their work ethic, especially the work ethic of my coach, coach Harold Weiland. Number one, this guy didn't take a day off for, I want to say about 40 years. I saw this guy and I was like, wow, this is what it takes. If you want to build something, you have to like live it and breathe it every single day, no days off. And uh, so Harold was like, had all these great fighters, right? Great fighters, high level fighters, champion fighters. He sees me, this little scrawny white guy. I can't throw a punch barely. And I knew that I would have to impress him with something else other than my skills. So over the course of the first year or two that I was there, I decided I was going to impress him with my work ethic. I decided I was going to spend more time in the gym training than any other guy there until he had no choice but to start to be like, all right, this guy, at least he wants it. That kind of took me through the next couple of years. When I started to get a little bit older, I started getting back into the powerlifting and that really changed things for me because I got injured in powerlifting really, really badly. I had an injury to my to my back, some other things that happened in my life. And I ended up basically with a partial paralysis of my left leg. And I couldn't lift. I could barely like to sit in a chair like I'm doing now. I couldn't do that. And that was a number of years. And I was just laid up. And I went into my mind that I said, I got to think of a way 
everything that I've learned, everything that I thought that I knew and understood about the body, it's not enough. I got to go back to the drawing board. And that's when I started to learn about the connection between the mind and the body. And that was what really got me into a higher level about like, I have to believe this almost as if it's already happened in order to, for the change to actually happen. I can't just be like, oh, let's see what happens. It's like, no, I'm doing this and that's why it will happen. So when I began to reprogram my mind, once I got into my 30s, immediately within about six months, I was like, wow, I can, I can walk, I can move. This is incredible. And I, to be honest with you, I'd like never thought that was going to end. I didn't think I'd ever lift weights again. And I said, well, what is the thing that you love the most now that your body works again? learned all this stuff. What's the thing that's like that you're the most excited about? I said, bodybuilding. It's always been bodybuilding since day one. So I started to train my body. I started to build up. I started to apply what I learned. And man, my body exploded. And around that time, this is around maybe six or seven years ago, I saw Ben Pakulski, a guy I followed on social media. There's a bit of a backstory there with, we had some common mentors that I learned a lot of stuff from. So he's in Tampa. I was down in Sarasota at the time. And he said like, we're doing this crazy new thing up in Tampa, a new concept gym with a different philosophy of how to approach weightlifting. No, no more as like a meathead uh, type of stuff. And I was so inspired. I just sent him a message. I said, hey, Ben, my name's Adam. This is my background. This is what I've done. What's up? I, where you're at is where I need to be. And I kind of went out on a, on a limb because this guy didn't know me. But the thing is, you just have to try. You just have to keep going. And he wrote me back. I came up to Tampa. Yes. I came up to Tampa. We talked and we hit it off and it was great. And um, that's how I got to MI40, just by like taking a chance on myself. I kind of envision, well, who is at the very top of where I want to be? Who is where I want to be? What are they doing? I got to go there. And that's kind of something that I really think is, is really important. It's not just the mind, like environment is critical. And I always wanted it. I had this really severe injury. And that took me out of the game, but also helped to really clarify everything. And then once I got the ability to use my body again, it was like a new lease on life. Was, I probably felt like a guy that goes to prison and then gets like on death row and then gets released. And so I just have this like unbridled optimism, like anything is possible. I can do anything and the body can do anything. And so... As a coach, that's like a pretty good outlook to have. <laughs> that's definitely helped me. Amazing. Yeah, I'm just speechless right now. So I, I, you know, wow, that's an incredible story to say the least. And uh, as long as I've known you and I've known you for a few months, that I appreciate you sharing all that. And that's, it's incredible the, the strides that you've, you've taken and you've come through. I want to circle back on a couple of things you said that one of the things that I, uh, you are not the first guest rather that has talked about leaving school, which... I've always been fascinated with considering how much school that I've, I've done and I commend people for that. And I, and I don't share this message often because there's a lot of backlash, you know, that comes with it because everybody's yeah. yeah, Like go to school, go to school, go to school. School's great. And school is great. And I tell people, you know, kind of my, one of my messages that I send out there is like, you need to become self-aware enough to know if school is the right place for you and you can always go back. Like I tell people like, have you ever tried to trade? Have you ever tried to, you know, teach yourself? Have you, you know, tried to take these other steps kind of similarly like you did, because at the end of the day, people will go through a four year degree or even go get a master's degree. And then pretty much all they wind up with the school debt and a job where they can't afford to, you know, live or, you know, pay for the things they need. And, you know, I know plenty of people like yourself that have been very successful that didn't go to school. Yeah. So I think that's a great message to start out with yeah. is that school is not, is it's not always the end all be all. It's, you can take other not, roads. But I want to, I want to touch on that. Like, yes, I didn't find what I was looking for in school because I was looking for something very specific, but I've paid a lot of money on continuing education courses and I've, for the past 15 years, I've sought out mentors that were always the very best I could find in the field. I told you I moved here from Sarasota and I was doing the boxing there. I moved to Sarasota to move with that boxing coach because I heard that he was the best in the state of Florida. And I stayed with him for years. And then I moved to where Ben was. And then now I'm with Kamal. And like the whole time, and before that, I was with Mike Massanelli and Tom Purvis. The whole time, I've always found guys smarter than me that I could learn from. I've spent diligent hours on my own, at home, on the internet, researching hours and hours and hours of everything I could find in like PubMed and studies and anecdotal stuff and like literally everything. So you, you, maybe you don't have to go to school, 
but you have to educate yourself. You have to have a thirst for knowledge. Yeah, you got to pay your dues. You pay your dues, man. So I want to talk about one of the biggest things that, uh, you know, I've always lived by or the sayings that I've always always said is you are the five people that you surround yourself with most. And I feel like you've not only grabbed onto that, but have accelerated that with the way that you've lived your life. So do you think that kind of had a profound effect on your 20s being around these boxers and these people that just are, it's like all or nothing? Like, it, how do you think that affected your mindset? It affected it in a, in a profound way and in ways that I couldn't have possibly understood at the time. Because you have to understand that, I didn't really mention this, like, the people that I was hanging out with were just like normal. They weren't doing anything in life. Nothing wrong with them. Nice guys. People I played music with, a guitar player, right? They're not going with their life in the way that I would have wanted. But just being around these people, I was like, whoa, that's possible. Like you can want something that much. You can dedicate yourself to it that much. You can will your way to succeed in something that you probably shouldn't. Just do it anyways. Just the grit. And um, yeah, absolutely. That completely, completely changed in my life because I was a person that I felt like I might say that I, I wouldn't say maybe I was sorry for myself, but I was like, oh, life is just the way that it is. Things happen to people. And I just accepted things. I accepted myself for how I was at that time. And then I realized and going to the bodybuilding, the bodybuilding is even a higher level because they're like, not only do I not have what I want right now, but I know that I'm going to have to grind for probably five to 10 years straight groundhog day, doing the same exact hard stuff every day, never missing. And then if I do that, but I will succeed like that investment in yourself, that much time, that much discipline, I wouldn't have known that that was even a thing I was capable of unless I saw so many other people that were, you know, no better than me, but they're doing it. They were living the dream. They're living the dream. Yeah. And we've talked about that when it comes to bodybuilding, some of these guys that have, have experienced great success and what, you know, competitions that they don't even really see their stride until they're like mid to late thirties. I would say, I would say you're starting to enter your prime around 35. Which that's after 10 to 15 because years. Athlete. Of, correct. And that, and that's after what, 10, 15 years of commitment. At least some of these yeah. guys started in high school 15 16 years old yeah in the weight room absolutely so you're, you're some of these guys 20 years before they really hit their like true prime which right. dedication day in day out and, and that's not just from like oh it took me that many years to develop my body it's also 20 years to develop my mind of grinding and building that that mental toughness so tell me we we transition into you know you you leave Sarasota the boxing gym you start at MI40 which is if you don't know what MI40 is it is the mecca yep it absolutely is the mecca and we've talked about it there's Gold's gym out in California there's the spot in New York and then there's MI40 it kind of is it's part of the top bodybuilding gyms in the country if not the world so how did you start at MI40 were you a trainer right away or how does just that work a, just a trainer yeah. Um, and said, Hey, I need some guys to train some of the athletes. There was one, one woman in, in particular, Patricia. And what was funny about Patricia, cause he brought me in specifically to work with her for a competition. I'd never coached a bodybuilder before. I was someone who understood it from a, like an intellectual level. And I worked out, I did all this stuff for myself, but I never coached someone that was going to get ready to compete in bodybuilding, only in fighters and stuff like that. And so I felt a bit over my head, man. I, I felt a little bit unsure of myself. Um, you know, I think we worked together for three or four months. So she won, got her pro card. Wow. Okay. So I, at that you knew point, something. At that point, I kind of proved it to myself. I was like, well, maybe Ben was right. Maybe I, yeah. <laughs> maybe this, I am the right guy for the job. And um, what you have to understand at that time was that the gym wasn't like how it is now. It was the, the, the owner, Ben, was a brilliant, brilliant guy. He basically just started it like as to be a social media studio for himself and a private gym because he didn't want other people around. When he was it in the him. same location? Same spot. Yeah. Okay. So it's been here for seven years? Six, seven 10 years. Almost. Okay. 10 years. Okay. Yeah. But the first couple of years, you know, it was just a couple of people doing some, some personal training and it was Ben's spot. And he, he liked it that way. He didn't really want it to turn into Gold's Gym. Yeah. It was never what he wanted. And especially when he was competing, like he don't want people around. It's his time, his place. 2018, Derek Lunsford met Ben and Derek ended up moving to Tampa and Ben kind of opened the door for him and said, hey, I think you got some potential. And he was just kind of like a top five in, in 212, which is like 
uh, one step lighter than the open bodybuilding, which is like the biggest guys. And he said, Derek, if you come here and you train with me and you train in this way, I think you can, I think you can be the champion. And, uh, years went by. He now is the current champion of the open. He's the biggest guy, but that was the first one. And people started to realize, Oh man, he went down there for a couple months and he looked insane. Maybe they're doing something different. So one by one, people started to come in, they started to visit, they started to message us and check it out. And over the years, it's sort of like evolved as we've seen that there is a possibility to turn this into a like into, I thought it just had more potential. I thought it could turn into a, like a, a factory for elite athletes. I thought this was, was a place where if you have the right stuff, then we can make you into something great. And that was like the vision that I had that I saw. It really wasn't that yet. And it was something that I really strongly pushed for. Now, that's my vision. It might be different from, from Ben's vision or from other people's visions, but I knew it was possible. And I was like, I'm going to push for this. I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to bring more people in. I'm going to invite more people. I'm going to keep the wrong people out. I'm going to keep it exactly what we need to be the environment where people's mindset elevates. Because you, what happens when you walk in there, is you see other people working harder than you, harder than maybe you've ever worked. And you're like, damn. At first, it's intimidating. And you're like, I'm going to try that. And so that's just how it goes in there is everyone pushes each other because you're constantly seeing people working at such an elevated level. They're, they're dedicating so much effort and it inspires people. So I'm part of the 6 a.m. crew. Uh, right. the, the elite 6 a.m. crew three times a week. And I love it. I, it's a staple in, you know, my day now. I feel we you changed it on me like two or three weeks ago. Like because I'm a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And you're like, can we train on Tuesday? It like threw off like part of my, my week, dude. I was like, and I told you, yeah, no, you're all good. I told you about that. And I was like, man, I was like, it's become such a staple in my life. So we got the 6 a.m. crew and a handful of homies and stuff like that. And all very, very nice people. And a couple of times, because the, the modern media group, the studio that we shoot this at, shout out to those guys, by the way, for, for allowing us to come and do this. They do an amazing job. It's right, you know, a couple offices down, basically, right down from the, the gym. Yeah, right down the block. And I came in at like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That's different than 6 a.m. That, that, was, that was the big people club. That, yeah. was, that was the adult club. And I was like, holy cow. And I, like, I messaged you, and I was like, dude, like this is like – this is insane. Like this is some like next level, like magazine competition. Like these people are crushing it. Any given day, you could just walk in there with a, with a camera and shoot a cover of a, of a muscle magazine. Yeah. Any day. They're all fit. They're all ripped. Yeah. They're all huge. And I'm just like, man, like I gotta, I gotta get my stuff together. So Guys and the girls. Yeah. Oh no. All there is no, uh, there is no differentiating that they all work very, very hard. And it's inspiring. Like you said, I mean, it's insane. And these people do it out of the love and the passion, which is, is something that's inspiring to me. And when I want to do something, it's like, look at the level that these people really put themselves out there. Like I, I want to be able to match that in other aspects of my life. And I want to circle back after I say that to say what you're talking about with the people that are there, what you've created there. And we've talked about it many times is culture. It's tell culture. me, tell me how important culture is. And I don't care what you're talking about, whether it's a club, whether it's a, it's a, um, you know, a gym, a business. Tell me how important culture is. It's the number one thing. Uh, I learned that from the boxing club. Um, I learned that from Coach Harold. I learned it from how he created a culture within the gym of two things. One is incredible hard work. The second thing is like helping the other guys in the gym. You know, you see a guy, he's not as good as you. He's, Let me show you a few things, buddy. You ever try to do it like this? And that's something that I've really tried to carry into, into the, into the MI40 gym. It's not just like, okay, we're positive and we're hardworking and everything. But when we see someone else, especially if they're not at the same level as us, we will find them and be like, Hey man, I'm Adam. It's good to meet you. What are you, what are you doing here? What are you working on? I bet that there's something that I know that I could share with you that'll help you on your journey. And we've created this, this like, the culture is one of extreme like community emphasis. So we, we all work. We don't necessarily work out together, but you can't, you can't do a hard set of squats without someone coming over and cheering you on. Right. And just the fact that there's always support, even from people that don't know your name, you guys are on the same journey or so that makes you on the same team, man, that's so valuable. That takes people so far. Cause then you can have someone, they just showed up, but they immediately feel like they've been kind of like taken, taken into the fold. And then they don't stay in that beginner state for very long. Immediately they jump up and jump ahead. So like the, the culture is 
it's everything. If you don't have a place where people feel uh, pushed to be their best and and, they never and celebrated it. and celebrated, yeah. If I see someone lift something that they've never lifted before, be like clapping for them, cheering for them. You know, even when I see like, okay, 6 a.m., you know, that girl that comes in and does the cardio and I'm like, hey, yeah. Hey, yeah, what's yeah, up? Yeah. yeah, let's go cardio every day, man. Every day. When you walk in the gym and someone's like happy to see you every day and they're like time to get that work done. And then if you don't and then they're like, where were you yesterday? <laughs> Dude, you're going to make crazy progress versus just being somewhere where you just a. Uh, a number, a cog in a machine. People. Is it more difficult with saying with, you know, the theme of culture, is it more difficult to the, create the culture or is it more difficult after you created the culture to keep the bad actors out? I think it's more difficult to sustain. I mean, you just have to do what you plan to do and it should work out pretty good in the beginning. But like you said, there's, there's, there's people who will come in who don't match your vision. The cool thing is that MA 40 they don't last. They. I was just going to say that to you. You guys have, and we've talked about it, have created such a culture that the good actors there almost kind of lead those people on to other pasture. Oh, yeah. The culture is so strong that the gym polices itself. Yeah. <laughs> so like, and it's really crazy. People will come and they'll come for a few weeks and they'll be like, I just didn't like it. I just didn't. It just wasn't for me. I had attitude. So yeah. I'm glad that you felt like it didn't work out for you because it wasn't working for us either. I'm not the kind of guy, unless you're causing a problem, I'm probably not going to kick you out. I'm happy to, if you're causing a problem, but fortunately the culture is so strong that I rarely have to do that. People just kind of work themselves out. And that's what you want. You do not want to let yourself be kind of like infected with, with negative person. That's death to your business. The biggest thing when, you know, I, I've been very lucky to be a part of my firm going on a year now transitioning over. And I had a great experience at my prior firm. Shout out to those guys. Um, but with with transitioning over to this firm, the number one thing I said to my partners is I want to create the best culture we can. You know, it, I, in my business, and, and I'm sure very similar in, in your your life as well, and then with MI40 and the lives of those people, it's so stressful. You, you got a lot of different moving parts, and I wanted to create the best culture that I could. And I think culture is so important to any organization and you know bravo to you guys and those people that really embrace that and try to create the best thing that they can for the people that they're involved with well, it starts out by just being deliberate by being like aware of like how i act every day is going to influence everyone else and so i have a, a, a real responsibility to set the precedent because it, it really trickles down and so people will, will just follow suit mostly you don't ne necessarily have to like tell people oh i need you to be a specific way you just show them People I don't believe you, but you got to show them. I've talked about in my content in the past, and, and I've learned this recently, is you have to, you know, first figure out who you are and then carry that over. And one of those things is that you have to go through and figure out what those non-negotiables are in your life. Right. Like whether it's kindness, whether it's getting up early, whether it's how you treat people, whether it's, you know, whatever it, you know, whatever you do. And you don't have to, like you said, shout those to the world. You just have to live those non-negotiables. And then obviously those people, those bad actors that we talked about, you know, either they'll ex extinguish themselves or sometimes it comes to the point where you have to kind of help them along to their it's next part of their journey. Yeah. yeah they expel them. I want to, I want to touch on that really quick. Yeah, please. There have been people that didn't work out and because I handled it in a respectful way and I always treated them with dignity you know what? We're still friends. We're still okay. They just don't want to train there. It's not where they want to train. That's not where they feel like they fit in, but they're not like, I hate those guys. They're like, I hate Adam. He was such a jerk. No one's going to say that because that's also not within the culture of being like, Oh, you're with us or you're against us. And we don't like you at all. That's not a good thing. You don't want to create enemies in this world. Like there's already enemies out there. It's okay to just be like cool with everyone and treat everyone with dignity and respect. We can't forget that, not only that human compassion, that human nature, but we can't forget that customer service aspect as well. Ooh, yeah. It's still a business at the it's end of this. Business. And you can be cool about like, hey, you know, this isn't a good vibe for either of us or, you know, mm -hmm. it, hopefully it works itself out. But at the end of the day, you know, you, you can be a, a, a gentleman or lady like when you, you know, dismiss somebody onto that, that yeah. next part of their life. So I want to transition into the training uh, and oh, yeah. your experience with training. I think my first question is, how do you identify how you're going to train somebody? And, and, and I don't want to take that a step further in all aspects between how you're talking to them, your mannerisms, how, you know, 
what exercises, it, it, the whole package, not just like, okay, this person needs to focus on chest. Let's, you know, do that. Or this person needs to focus on back. Yeah, that's the, the so how do you, part, right? yeah. How do you look at the whole holistic, like, here's how I'm going to bring the best out of somebody. Cause that's what you're really doing. I mean, so it's, it's, it's an art form and there's some instinct involved. I wouldn't necessarily say that I meet someone with a checklist. Okay. You're this type of person and you need this, which I think a lot of people do that's in the, the fitness thing. space. It's, it's like disrespectful. Yeah. I think that's an awful way to, to go about it. You want to like, you know, I want to be in the room with you. I want to be talking to you. I want to be engaged with you. I want to like eye contact. I want to hear what you're saying. I want to hear what you mean when you don't say certain things. I need to be perceptive of all that. So I meet someone I say, hey, we're going to do some training. I'm going to give you some very basic stuff. Because the first thing I want you to do is basically learn how to use your body, not the machines. I want you to learn how to use your body. But the whole first workout or the first couple of workouts is like an interview. I'm really just trying to understand that person's nature. I'm trying to understand what their hangups are. The most important thing for me to figure out is why they're actually there and why now, right? Most people that want to get in shape have wanted to get in shape for like years, maybe many years. So why not before? Why now? Something is different in their life. That's the thing that I know for certain. Something happened. They've had a change of mindset and they're like, okay, today is the day. And so I need to understand that because I, that's actually something that they're running away from. They're running away from the discomfort of whatever that they were presented with. And what my job is to do is to give them something to run towards. So I want to build them up very slowly and I don't want to create a situation where there's no intimidation so my first couple of workouts, I don't try to hurt them, even though I'm known as the reaper in the gym because I bury people. I want people to be like, oh, this place isn't that scary. This guy is not that scary. Oh, he's actually kind of cool. And he's, he's a little funny. And this, these people at the gym are actually pretty cool too. The first barrier to entry is you not being comfortable. So I want to make you comfortable so you'll keep coming back. But then we want to start to break your mind down. We want to say, okay, what is, what is this individual struggling with? So it's some aspect of their mental, usually in their self-perception. It's, it's a, it's an identity thing. Like people like, okay, this is just the most obvious thing. Cause people usually come to a trainer to lose weight. The reason why you want to lose weight has a lot to do with like your personal identity. I identify, I am a person that eats pizza when I'm stressed. If you, that's a belief that you have, then you will always do that. So we have to kind of change your beliefs about yourself. Like I told you about me when I went to the boxing gym, when I started there, I wasn't a person who believed that I was someone that could train that hard. And then it was slowly exposed to, oh, I can do that. And then when my belief about myself changed, oh, I'm a person that's capable of incredible hard work. Guess what? By the time I believed that, I had a six pack. But it wasn't because I tried to get a six pack. I tried to change my beliefs and then my body changed. So we want to try to get the person to change what they think about themselves, remove their limiting beliefs and replace them with like, oh, I'm a person that gets up at 6 a.m. every day because I can't miss a workout. When you change your, your, your belief to I'm a person that can't miss a workout or I feel guilty, you're probably going to be fine. Like if you change your, your guilty you, right here, that would be me. <laughs> yep. And it's also the belief of like, man, I always eat when I'm stressed out. OK, well, you believe that. You need to, you need to stop guilty. It. You, need yeah. To, yeah. you need to prove to yourself that that's not always the case. And then once that happens and that's like probably being realistic, it's like six months to like two or three years. It does not happen overnight that I like identity and you stop the behavior, but your belief isn't going to change overnight. Right. But once you've proven it to yourself, then you can start to really make the big change. So I'm just trying to like figure people out where they're at and I'm trying to really constantly like, nurture positive thinking. That's the big thing. I'm like, you're doing so good. And I know you can do more. And that's the big thing. When you show someone that you really do believe in them, it's not about being disappointed. It's, it's being excited for them. Like I, I, I don't believe in negative motivation, not much, a little bit. Like if you're really being soft. I'm going to call you soft, but <laughs> shocker at the end of the day that like, we know that's, that's pretty proven to not be as effective why don't you instead make someone love to work hard and they'll never have any problems. If you love to work, like you, you you're going to, you're going to be successful. I was, yeah. And, and I went through that journey with you. I mean, I was, in, I would say I was somewhat intimidated, not too intimidated, but I was like, I went to that first session and I'm like, this guy's going to try to hurt me. Like he's going to try to show me who's boss is and stuff like that. Cause that, that's kind of what I've always like 
kind of seen and experienced. And and I was the many year guy, many years guy. I was super in shape in college, law school kind of you know dwindled. I was with my wife, God bless her. And over the years, as I gained more success, I also gained more pounds. So it, it was funny how that happened hand in hand. And for me, I you know I did seventy five hard and I completed it, which was a huge motivation. For me, the biggest thing was I wanted to go back to looking like that guy that my wife, you know, fell in love with. And she loves me for a lot of reasons. And I'm very, very lucky to have Mrs. Sullivan, as everybody knows her by. But I was she was a huge motivation for me. I was like, I want to do this for her. I want to do it for us. And we have an amazing marriage. And and she's not, you know, I don't want to think anybody like, oh, the rumors are starting. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but for me, like that was a huge motivation. Like I felt like I owed that to my relationship. And then the secondary motivation was I felt like I owed that to my clients and my coworkers and the people that I was working with. Like, I want to be the best version of myself. And I fell into the false pretenses like you talked about. As I said, I want to lose weight. And I was, you know, that that's what I thought was success when it comes to like fitness and health. And I weighed myself the first couple of times and I know I need to get back to weighing myself, but we'll leave that there. But I wasn't really losing any weight. I was like, you know what? Forget that. Like I'm not weighing myself unless Adam tells me I have to. And I I just want to keep looking better. And it was like within the last like two weeks or whatever, my wife, I think it was like the last couple of days, actually, my wife was like, you're looking skinnier. And I'm like, thank you. And that was like, that was all I needed. Like, I don't care what the scale says or anything like that. Obviously we have to track and measure things, but like to be able to make that leap is the, all that really matters. And and that's ultimately, like you said, what it's developed into is number one is I can't miss a workout because I've, I've made that commitment. That's become one of my non-negotiables. And then number two is that I want to be the best version of myself. It's not about being skinny. It's not right, about like, right. I don't care about that as much as like, I just want to look good. And that's what we're going for. Yeah, man. So I appreciate you for that. And yeah, I, I followed your training and it worked. So like beyond like the, the looks, the looks are good, right? They're great. Let's be real. But it's also being the best version of yourself. It's about like living kind of like in integrity. Like if you can't be this person that's like do all this and work this hard and sacrifice and save and like you're incredible financially, you're incredible in business, you're incredible with your family, you're incredible with your kids, but you got high blood pressure, you're pre-diabetic, what? You've completely like just ignored part of who you are as a person and said all the other stuff is important. You can't only take care of your left side of your body and, and, and take care of your right. And it's the same thing. You, you can't take care of your finances and not your fitness because all of that, it goes together into you as a person. And if you respect yourself and you want to be respected, um, you have to treat your body with, with respect and after, honestly with love. And I said to you, one of the, you know, the most powerful things that happened through this journey, um, I told you probably a month ago, I think I came in on like a Monday and you were like, how was the weekend? I was like, I was good. And he go, and you know, we just catch up like usual. And he goes, you know, what'd you do or anything? And I go, one of the coolest parts of the weekend was that we have like, it's basically a quarter mile. Like we live on somewhat of a cul-de-sac, like our neighborhood. It's a quarter of a mile around from our house around. And I said, my son was wilding out, running around and I threw him on my shoulders and I, I carried him around the whole time, quarter mile without like a care in the world. No, you know, pain. No, it was like very comfortable. And he probably weighs like 30 something pounds. It's about the things that you can use fitness for in life to your point and to improve your life, not just because you want to look good, but looking good is cool too. People think the quality of life is something that only starts to become a factor when you're like old. No. You, you got a kid, you want to be able to run around with him outside. You want to be able to throw the ball. Do you want to like, do you want to be able to um, maybe go on a, on a vacation and be on your feet all day or, and take the stairs instead of the elevator and put your kid on your shoulders? All these things like your life sucks if you can't do any of those things. And it can be great. There's so many great things that are in some ways like they have physical demand. So you want, there's, there's so many benefits to being in pretty good shape don't have to be an elite athlete, right? You're going to take care of yourself. Well, speaking of elite athletes, yes. you know, you've mentioned the Kamals and the Derricks and, and all these incredible people um, who was just here from, it was a Germany, Tim, right? Tim, yeah. 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 Tell me about what it's like to work out with some of these incredible competitors. That's been one of the most beneficial things of, of my experience in the last, you know, six years at MI40 is not just that the people come and I see them, but I train with them. I train, I've been training with 
elite competitors uh, the whole time that I've been there, starting with Derek. And for the last two and a half years, I've been with Kamal, who's Olympia champion, Masters Olympia champion, and Arnold champion, right? So he's got the triple crown. That was my exposure to like freak level mindset because, you know, there's levels to the game. And there's expand on that, please. I mean, I don't want to like rank it from like one to 10, but like there is a huge difference in between the mindset of an amateur, a low level amateur, a high level amateur, elite amateur, low level pro, mid level pro, high level pro, elite pro. You can see it. You can see it's not just in their bodies, it's in their minds. That's how their body got that way. And the elite, there's. I'll, I'll call it sub-elite and then elite. So I'll just talk about the two differences between the highest level and the level that's right below that. The difference is not in how hard they'll work. They'll work. The difference is in their attitude about the work. Kamal, to me, is my favorite example of someone that has mastery over his attitude because he, he will do the hardest thing that breaks other people mentally. And you'll say, how, do you, how are you feeling? Just be like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I shouldn't be feeling anything. If you ask him if he's bad, if he's feeling bad, he says, why would I be feeling bad? Like, you know how lucky I am to be able to put food on my kid's table by lifting weights. I'm going to complain about this opportunity. He never complains. That's the biggest thing about the people at the highest level is that they never complain. They don't complain about anything and things don't get to them. And if they fail, the amount of time between a failure and, 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 and like, you know, rallying and trying again, it's, it's like momentary. So they immediately, they get back on the horse. They never let things divert them or, or stop them. They maybe they can be slowed down a little bit temporarily. Things happen in life, right? Obviously. And none of these guys have had perfectly smooth rides. Kamal is a perfect example of this with, he's had a very challenging up and down life with like a lot of toil, know what I'm saying? But you you see him, he's not like a guy that's like, man, I had a hard life, but I finally make it. He's like, man, I'm so lucky. I love my life. I love, I love, if you can, I said this earlier, if you fall in love with working hard, it won't, you won't be struggling. There's an idea of kind of having no sympathy for yourself and for when things are hard or when you're suffering. Bodybuilding is unique in that the diet is really mentally hard. You're basically starving yourself for months on end. And that breaks people down mentally because you feel very bad. You feel as if you're starving, which feels bad. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you want to quit every second of the day. Every second of the day, your physiology is trying to tell you, I will die if you continue with what you're doing. And the high level guys find a way to not only just like, they ignore that, but they accept it. The same thing that would crack a person down in a moment, they live with every moment for months. And so, yeah, they love to work, but they're not afraid of feeling bad. They're not afraid of hard days. They're not afraid of, oh, I didn't sleep good. Oh, I got to wake up. I got to do two hours of cardio, whatever. Oh, I've got to, I've got a squat today and I'm probably going to throw up, whatever. They're just in there. They're just very dispassionate about the idea that like suffering is a negative thing. That's huge. Like people feel sorry for themselves. And if you feel sorry for yourself, you're never going to make it that far because you'd be too sympathetic for yourself. You're like, oh, this is hard. I'll just take a break. It's going to be hard. It's going to suck a lot of the time. So they've accepted that suffering is a part of the process. They've accepted the suffering. And and they developed ways to get past it. In fact, even further. I want to take that another level. This is... This is what I saw when I met Rachel Daniels. They pursue suffering. Suffering will make you better. So the more you can suffer, the better you will be. So they find things that are really hard. And in fact, when they're sitting there, their stomach's grumbling and they're sweating and it's late at night and they can't sleep. They say, I'm getting better. Right now in this moment, I'm getting better. And that feeds their mind. Instead of thinking, oh, this is so hard. This is so hard. They're like, I'm getting stronger. I'm getting stronger. Whoa, what a different, powerful reframing of that experience. So that's that's a big thing. It's like what they it use means, it as fuel rather than restraint. Yeah. What does it mean to them when they're feeling bad? Well, it means I'm getting better versus, the, oh, I'm going without. They don't feel like they're going without. The only thing they don't want to go without is a trophy, right? Wow. If you can 
like, I'm just trying, I'm breaking all this down in my mind right now. That's in, I don't want to call it insanity. I mean, that's just like another level. I mean, if you, I'm just thinking about all the different ways that our audience can apply that to their own lives where it applies like to everything. it does. No, a hundred percent. I was just like, it's so profound. I mean, if you essentially use suffering as fuel rather than rather than restraint, how much further could you go? Like, I mean, the sky's the limit at that point. As far as because the, the good is the go. good, and the ba- and the bad is still the good. That is still because good. it's still because at the end of the day, it's all going to get you where to where you want to be. And really, the end goal is all that matters. Right. And once you get there, are you really suffering that much? No, you great because you got what you, you got, wanted. You got paid, and you got what you wanted, and you feel so good when you suffered for what you wanted, and you didn't quit. You feel so good. Incredible. Incredible. Switching gears, talking about, you know, good, bad, ugly social media. Mm. Do you think social media, I know, well, get comfortable for this one, my friend. Yeah, here we go. Do you think social media has helped or hurt the fitness industry? And I'm not going to lead you with this one. Kind of take, take that for what it is. So look, social media, it's terrible. It's awful. So... I told you I didn't go to school and I found the people that I thought were the best in the world to learn from. Social media influencers are generally the worst in the world. They have very little useful information. That's why they're not actually working in the field. They have nothing to do with their time other than make social media posts. So when you, one, when you go on social media to try to learn the answers to your questions, you will be pointed invariably in the wrong direction. Every person I talk to that says, I watched this video on YouTube. I saw this post on Reddit. I saw this, this reel on Instagram. What do you think about this? And then they tell me the most ridiculous backwards idea. So it's, you know, there's probably good stuff on there. The real problem isn't just like, oh, I'm getting bad advice. It's the, you're comparing yourself to the people that have worked for 30 years. You're not getting any of the benefits of their mindset. You're not getting any of the benefits of their experience. You're not seeing how they live day to day. You're just like, hmm, why don't I look like that? So I think social media has basically made people really unhappy because it's created such a strong culture of, of comparison and inadequacy. And I think that I think that's a negative that you can't pull a positive from. And I think it's pulling it's pulling people away from each other. Like you just go find some people to lift with in your gym, man. You do much better. Or find a local coach. Um, so social media, it's given people, it's given the rise to some of the worst lifting technique. It's given rise to some of the worst, silliest thinking about the right way to do things. It's made people incredibly unhappy with their bodies. It's, it's made people. So here's a thing that I want to talk about. This is a passion, a sport a path in life that won't probably make most people a lot of money, right? Not a lot of people are retiring off of bodybuilding. Most people spend money to compete. If it's your highest passion, that may be okay. But what I see, this is my big problem with social media. It has all these people like, oh, I'm going to drop out of school and I'm going to become a bodybuilder. You don't know anything about bodybuilding. (laughs) So I think it takes people in this, oh, I'm going to go and use more social media. And you're really not building life skills. You're not putting in the work. You're not building yourself up. You just try to kind of like, okay, I'm just going to take pictures of myself and and that's going to be enough. And it's a very dishonest way of kind of like looking at, you know, people want things they get value from. There's a million pictures of a million people on the internet. We don't need more of that. That's not adding value to anyone really. And it's, it's causing people to become more insecure. And uh, I just think it's really bad for people's minds. I think also, if you're just on your phone all day, you're destroying your, your dopamine too. So the two, the two biggest issues that I see with it, and I, I think there are some positives, you know, There's as far positives. as if you can connect with people with, like, you know, like ideas and stuff like that, if you can find those people. I mean, I think there's there's a handful of positives. The two biggest things that are scary for me is, number one, is the body image stuff. As far as some of these people that you're idolizing, maybe using Photoshop or AI or anything else to kind of. Shout out Goob you. Um, <laughs> that's your, yeah, that's your people. That's your guy. Guess what? It turns out that literally every person that you look at on the internet is photoshopping themselves. Yeah. So that you have to just take that. 
Take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't look like that. The second thing that really scares me, and I think is from a safety perspective, is the um, the vanity lifting. Just like mm, you see these hurt. guys, yeah, picking up like this. Which I mean, kudos for you if you you know you can you know do powerlifting and he- lift heavily, heavily, and such. But you know you're encouraging these young people that they got a deadlift, you know, three four plates on each side in order to get what they want to be. And we're really missing the form over function. And we've even talked about the Arnold training back in the day where when he was, you know, using free weights, I think they had what up to a hundred pounds or something like that. So he ended up hitting the hundreds for 10 and then the nineties and then the eighties and then the seventies and working all the way down. There was no, you know, 200 pound dumbbells back then. There was none of that stuff. You know, he exhausted the muscle and did things the right way. I mean, yeah, like, okay, Arnold maybe talked about, okay, maybe you can swing the weight sometimes. And, but he also talked about technique and he talked about form. I think form and technique, like I could do a whole hour long talk about how important or not important it is to lift with certain techniques. But like, if you're, if you're chasing numbers, if your goal is to have a different number on the dumbbell in your hand that you're lifting, if that's the goal, that's not a good goal. (laughs) That's not going to take you very far. Oh, I just want to lift a heavier weight. Because again, the thing is about, okay, how can I transform my mind so I can transform my body so I can transform my life? Chasing bigger number dumbbells. You should be chasing bigger number bank statement. Okay. Not bigger. You know, if you do all the things you're, this is my opinion. If you do the things you're supposed to do, train with proper technique, get good recovery, have a good diet. You're going to be really strong after a little while. You're going to be stupidly strong, okay? But you didn't have to, like, try to chase it at the expense of everything else because guess what? I had this back injury that almost took me out of the game, and most people that I know that stop bodybuilding, they stop because they get injured. It wasn't because they got bored or because they lost their passion. It's because they weren't able to anymore. So there's a, there's a thing. of it's like, it's like the cost of doing business, and if that's how you do business, there's a really serious cost that is associated with that. So the number one way to continue to be able to make progress is to not be backsliding. <laughs> Don't be going backwards. If you're going to just at least stay still, you're doing better than the guy that's going backwards. So if you get hurt, if you do something that takes you out of the game or you do something that causes you to get maybe burnt out, which is also just as bad, um, now you're moving backwards. So that is that is death. Yeah, it's better to take one step forward and zero steps back than two steps forward and five steps back. Yeah, so, and this is the thing we talk about with Kamal is that the, uh, cause he's an older guy. He's in his fifties, still competing and still winning. So he's doing something right. He's got no serious injuries. I never had a serious injury. And we talk about the, the younger generation of bodybuilding and really heavy lifting is super, I would call it trendy right now. It's like in vogue to be able to do a lot on the deadlift and door rows and stuff like that. Look, these are great exercises and it's great to lift heavy and lifting heavy stim. But you guys are doing it, some of you are in a way that not everyone, but some of you are going to pay the price. Mm-hmm. And I, I hate to see it. It's true. I mean, it, it's true. And, and I'm a huge fan, but we've talked about in the past, Ronnie Coleman. I mean, amazing. Perfect amazing. Example. Yeah. And, and it was a massive power lifter, a magnificent human being. And he's definitely having some significant struggles right now. It's a great one. And I, I want to be... Uh, very respectful because I do consider him to be the greatest bodybuilder to ever live. Oh, goat all day. And I don't want to lightweight, baby. Light, mm, yeah. Light, baby. So here's the thing. Like, you know, Ronnie kind of did this to himself. If you don't know much about Ronnie, he's the person who was at one time the biggest man alive. And he is to me today, the greatest bodybuilder to ever live, but his body is not in a great shape right now. He had something like eight back surgeries. And it's horrible. It's unfortunate. And here's the thing. Like I said, there's a, there's a cost of doing business. So you have to make sure that the cost is worth it to you. Now he got to be world champion. He gets to sit you know, high on the hog. He's very good financially. It's his family and his children are very set up. If that's not what you're getting out of the gym, which is true for 99.9999% of all people, it's not worth it to kill yourself break yourself down. And I went through that with my back and I said, man, this wasn't worth it. Yeah. This wasn't worth it. This is what I got into this. Like people lift weights to be healthy, right? Like at least in the beginning. And so uh, 
that really helped me to cultivate my philosophy towards training where it was like, nothing is worth the price that I paid at the price that Ronnie paid in my mind. Not because like, once you get, once you're that far gone, it's kind of over, man. You're not doing anything else. You're done. Hang up your hat. So how can you stay in the game? It's unfortunate. Yeah. And that's the whole thing at the end of the day is staying in the game and being healthy. I mean, that's, that's what fitness is all about. So if people are not getting information from social media or, or should not get a bulk of their information from social media, mm-hmm. where would you suggest that people get their fitness information from? You, you should hire a coach. Yeah. You should hire a coach that you investigate very, very thoroughly, really look into their background, see what they've done and who they've worked with. And yeah, you can look at their social media because I'm sure they have one. But you need to basically, it's like anything else. If I just walk down the street and I ask 10 different people's opinion on how they like this shirt, I'm going to get 10 different answers. So you go on the internet, you're going to hear 10 different things that people say, you got to eat like this, lift like this. Just find one person that you trust, listen to to what they say because it will work. That's that's why you hired them because they have a good track record. Just try it. Just try it. And stop thinking that, you know, there's always some better way of doing There's not a better way. There is a one way, the hard way. That's, you know, you just have to do the hard stuff. And people don't want to hire a coach because they think like, oh, I can outsmart everyone else. There's some secret that they haven't figured out that if I spend enough time on Instagram scrolling, I'm going to figure out the answer. There's no answer, man. That's not, what do we do every day? Heavy weightlifting. And then there's cardio and then there's chicken and rice. It's not like there's some crazy magical formula. I promise everyone out there that thinks that there's some, some secret. There's none. <laughs> I can tell you if there was between the, the blessings and, and I say this humbly between the blessing and the resources that I have, if there is a shortcut that was the right way to go about things, we would probably not be sitting here today. And at the end of the day, no matter who is sitting in that gym, they're doing the same exercises that I've, I'm doing. They're using the same weights that I'm using, and they're putting in the same work that I'm putting in. There's no shortcuts when it comes to fitness. I can promise you I would have figured it out. And I, I want to say that, you know, one of the biggest things that I would tell people when where to get your fit, fitness information from is try four or five different things. Like – Online coaching may not work for you. I, For example, I had to do – I had some great people you know, that I worked with prior, but at the end of the day, I knew I had to do in-person coaching. I had to be held accountable. Uh, my schedule was so busy that I had to block off that hour for the day. Some people online may work for them. Some people, you know, maybe larger gyms may work. Some people need private training. Figure out what works for you. Yeah, you're going to have to probably try a couple of different yeah, things. Yeah, 100%. I've tried many different things. I've tried every type of gym from the – Biggest corporate gym. And that's not a fail. Trying multiple things is not a fail. It's like Edison making light bulb. He said, I figured out 999 ways not to make a light bulb. It only took that one. Well, even you can look at all the people that are successful at a really high level and all of them probably do things in some way differently, right? Yeah, they're all lifting weights, but maybe some is working at this gym, some working out that gym. Some have an online coach, some have a local coach. Some like to eat a lot of carbs. Some don't like to eat carbs, right? You know? There's preference. There's room for preference in everything. And if you try to make a square peg fit into a round hole, you will fail every time. So, you know, maybe it's bodybuilding is not for you. Maybe you need to do Pilates. You got to try them all, man. It's some, something's going to speak to you. It's like the answer is not sitting at home on the couch. You, if you yeah. haven't found it yet, keep looking. Keep Maybe you got to find a community. Maybe that's the answer. Maybe you got to find some way to make it fun. Um Maybe involve your family, maybe involve your kids, something, man. There's, there's an answer, but, but, but what a lot of people do, this doesn't work for a lot of people. They just join, I'm not going to name them, but the big box gym Mm -hmm. and it's full of random people and they can't get on the machine that they want and they can't get on a set schedule because it's so crazy and they go in there. It kind of gives them anxiety because it's like just a zoo for a lot of people. That's probably not going to work. Don't just stop there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's when you, and that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. 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 Try something else. I will. And I, and I'll end with this and, and I want to highlight what you said. If you do retain somebody or you do go with a particular process, tr- trust the process, 
listen to those people. I told you multiple times when we first started working together, I said, this is the one hour of the day that I don't have to think. And I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I want to put the the faith in you and I recommend the people out there as well. If you're going to hire a coach or if you're going to go through with a certain plan, plan rather, trust the process, stick with it, you know, try it out and then make, you know, adjustments from there. Yeah. So, you know, you're going to go in whatever, wherever you're at, you're going to go look for someone that can help you. You don't need to find Albert Einstein to tell you to cut your carbs down. You don't need that. Just find someone that's done it and, and listen to them. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, okay, if I want to make a million dollars and you made $10 million, but not a billion dollars, okay, I can still listen to you. You still know what to do, right? You don't need to be Elon Musk. You don't need to be the greatest of all time. If you can find that person, great. But you just need to find someone you can trust. Someone that, you know, you think they have your best interest in mind. Well, with that... I can't thank you enough for for taking care of me and uh, joining us today on the Not an Accident podcast. I don't say this enough times, but please like and subscribe. It's going to help the channel grow. I appreciate you watching the videos. Make sure to comment your favorite part. And as always, we'll end with it is not an accident that Adam is as successful as he is. So thank you, my friend. I appreciate you taking the time. We're out. We'll see you next time.